Good afternoon. How's all things open greeting you? All right. Everybody got your caffeine? More or less? All right. All right. Well, welcome everybody to Introduction to GitHub Copilot. My name is Grant Lasker, and I'll be your host uh, presenter for the next 45 minutes. So what we're going to do in this session is to do a set of slides uh, and kind of give you an idea about what Copilot is, a little bit about how it functions and about how some of the uh, advantages, maybe challenges with it as well. And so we're going to do a couple of slides, two slides, and then assuming that the uh, demo gods are smiling on us and the uh, Wi-Fi star is aligned, we'll do some demos as well uh, to finish out the session. All right, so just a little bit about me very quickly. Uh, my day job is a DevOps director at a company called SAS, just down the road from here. Got some SAS people in the house. A few of them, yeah, quite a few actually. Uh, and I do a little bit of training uh, as a sort of a side thing, a hobby, and uh, on various topics, open source topics. Also have a number of different little things I've written over the years, uh, a couple of books out there, uh, Jenkins 2, Git, Learning GitHub Actions, by the way, if anybody's interested, we are doing a book signing, give away free copies uh, immediately after this downstairs. So come see me there if you are interested in getting a copy of one of those. Um, disclaimer, so <clears throat> opinions, typos, ramblings are mine. Uh, generated code is on Copilot, but if you are, if you do want to, you can rate this uh, session on the mobile app. There's a way to do that on there. So let's jump into it. What is GitHub Copilot? So GitHub Copilot is cloud-based generative AI tool. Generative meaning it actually generates content. Generates content based off of the context that you supply in your IDE, uh, in well, a number of the things we'll talk about in a few minutes. But it's cloud-based in that the data is going back across over to the GitHub side. GitHub's doing some processing on it against a large language model. Uh, similar to the chat GTP uh, process, and then bringing back suggestions into your IDE. It turns natural language prompts into coding suggestions. GitHub Copilot is all about the coding domain. It's not about everything else. It's about the coding domain. It's specifically trained for that. It works across dozens of languages, programming languages. Uh, all the ones that you would see out in public repositories, uh, Go, Java, TypeScript, any of the ones you have out there. Now, with that said, it's going to be uh, more suggestive, have better suggestions probably, for the ones that have a larger representation in that public code base out there. So the more popular languages, the ones that have been uh, utilized more, the ones that have been put out on GitHub, the repositories there, Copilot is going to have a wider base that's been trained on for those. Trained on billions of lines of code, functions similar to an AI pair programmer. And I've got the asterisk there, and that's mine, as I said, opinions are mine. Um, a lot of times we, this is advertised as the AI pair programmer. And the one caveat I'll put with that is that I tend to look at it for using it for a while, looking at other people use it, as more of something that you would treat more like somebody who is new to the code base, at least. Perhaps maybe thinking of it more like having a uh, assistant programmer helping you out. But someone who may not understand all the nuances all the context and stuff in there. It's very important when we talk about this that we realize that while it is generating code, it is still ultimately sort of a predictive uh, system. It's a predictive AI system based off the context it has. It can miss nuances. It might suggest things that are not as good as what you would normally do. It might suggest things that are better than what you would normally do. So it's still important to have that human filter in the process there. It works on multiple IDEs, and for best benefit, in my opinion, again, it really needs to be paired with Copilot Chat. So the basic Copilot that's out there now, that's available to you to try out or to sign up for and pay for, is just the Copilot interface in the IDE. It doesn't have the chat included with it. Chat is in beta. Chat being the interface where you can type in things like in chat GPT and get answers back. Chat's in beta. Uh, we're expecting to hear more about sort of how that's going to be priced or how it's going to be packaged, that sort of thing. Probably GitHub Universe, November 8th and 9th in there. So how can Copilot help? What kinds of things can it do? How can it help you in your day-to-day -day activities? Well, you've got the sort of, you know, the things that uh, we have out there 
um, as advertising the benefits of it, 55% faster coding, 46% code written, so on. But here's some of the things that I've seen it do and some of the things that you'll hear about as well. Code suggestions for nearly any current language. Again, the idea, the basic idea with Copilot is I am typing in my IDE or my interface, and then I'm going through, and Copilot is suggesting code based off of the context I have in there. It's popping up code suggestions in the editor as I type. Comment-driven code creation. I can supply a comment to Copilot, tell it define a function that uh, checks a URL to see if it's valid, that sort of thing. And it can generate suggested code for that. Automatic test generation. Copilot can generate unit tests. You can generate unit tests based off your context. Again, you have to kind of look at them to make sure they still are the right ones, the ones you'd use. But you can have it generate as many unit tests as you want and give you some ideas out there. You can go in and tweak the description as well. You know, say give me five unit tests or give me a test that tests for an invalid value, those kinds of things. SQL generation, one that's not talked about as much, but you can have it actually generate queries, uh, tables, indices, store procedures. Uh, if you give it context about your layouts, about your tables and such, you can actually do a pretty good job of it. You can have it generate very uh, nicely defined tables, indices, store procedures, all those kinds of things. Regular expression generation. Who likes to write regular expression? A couple of you. Who doesn't like to write regular expression? More people. Okay. Uh, Copilot can generate regular expression for you. It does a really nice job of that. Uh, again, have to review it, but it does a nice job of that. makes it very simple to do. I'll try to show you an example of that in demos if we have time. Pattern mapping generation. Um, there's an example I've done where you tell it to like a generate uh, mapping of states to area codes, those kinds of things. So you can have it generate mappings there. You have it generate data. Uh, you can have it generate dummy data and so on in there. You're limited a little bit depending on how much data you're trying to generate by the amount of stuff that it turns back at any one time. Uh, there is a limit to that, but you can actually, there are some ways to work around that as well. Document code. You can tell Copilot to document your code. Now, the documentation is going to be very, you know, uh, strict and specific to what the code does, but it will explain it in a more human readable form. You can tell it to explain the code, similar idea. What does this code do? It could go through and tell you what the code does in, again, the English form. It's that kind of chat, the interactive thing with the AI where it can converse with you in more of a human-like uh, intonation, more of a human-like dialogue there when it's doing these kinds of things. You can have it fix code. If you have an error in the code, uh, if you've been in your IDE, like VS Code, and you have like a little light bulb pop up when you have something that's gone wrong in there, you can tell Copilot to go off and fix it. In some cases, it can go off and fix it. Some cases, you may need to do a little bit more with it. You could have a review code. You can tell it to review code and say, hey, go off, tell me about this code. It'll say things like, well, it looks pretty well structured to me, or maybe you could simplify it this way, that sort of thing. So it's actually pretty cool in terms of all those different things. Translating code. You can have it create code like in Python. Uh, if we get time, I'll do an example of that. And then have it translate the code into, say, Go. Have it generate that way. Uh, you can generate Kubernetes manifest. A little bit of random one, but it's kind of cool in there. Uh, you can know, generate a manifest for a particular sort of image, running certain replicas, and so on. And you can say things like, what is the API? What is the API to scale a Kubernetes deployment to three, three replica sets? And it can come back, give that back to you as well. And even more. So kind of the general sort of big use cases for Copilot that seem to emerge. Uh, generating boilerplate code, less time reading docs, less time recalling syntax. Helpful when learning a new language. Um, re reducing the cognitive load, kind of a fancy word for not having to make us worry and think as much about all of the things that kind of take the fun out of coding. So the whole point of this is kind of to let programmers focus on the problem more, or at least that's the sort of main effect we hope to get out of it, is that Copilot is there to help handle the things where you don't need necessarily to spend your time on trying to figure out. You're trying to figure out how to really solve the problem. Copilot is there to help take care of the other parts of it for you. What are some challenges? Again, from my perspective. So 
I put this dialog up here for a reason. This is dialog that comes up when you first log into chat, when you first show up chat. Notice it says, I'm powered by AI, so surprises and mistakes are possible. Make sure to verify any generated code or suggestions and share feedback so we can learn and improve. So, Copilot is, of course, not infallible. It is going to make suggestions. It is not a, a reason, not a reason. It, it still needs to have the standard sorts of checks and balances, right? You still need to have code reviews, still need to have validations, testing, all those kinds of things. It may be giving you the exactly the right answer, but you still need to go through and make sure. Uh, sometimes you should, well, you should always have human oversight or review only as good as the context or prompt. By con context and prompt, we're talking about the surrounding information that Copilot can use to determine the suggestion it's going to give you. Things like the files that are open in your IDE, things like the code that's above and be, uh, below your cursor, those kinds of things in there. So one of the skills of learning to use Copilot is actually about learning to do prompt engineering, learning to develop that set of content there that's going to give you the best results when using Copilot. There's a learning curve associated with it, as with any tool. There's a learning curve when you first start and you're trying to figure out, is it actually generating something? Is it going to give me more? Those kinds of things in there. Um, sometimes you need nudging. That's my word. Sometimes you'll be trying to have it generate something and it will just sort of seem to not respond or not return. If you start typing then, you know, like a word function or one of the expected words in there, sometimes that will nudge it along a little bit further to keep moving. Hallucinations. Anybody heard the term of hallucinations in AI? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, you know, I had a friend of mine who was actually trying to use ChatGPT to plan his uh, vacation itinerary going to Hawaii. He thought it was doing a great job, so he noticed that the hotel it was putting in didn't exist. It could be the same thing with Copilot. You can have variables or something or dependency names, something that don't that are in the code that aren't correct. So you still have to have this sort of again, the intelligent human filter looking at the code, making sure that what is generated, even if it looks syntactically, semantically correct, is still going to have the right things in it, still has the right context. Date problem. And I say that kind of loosely, but it is worth being aware of that any in fact, this is true for any AI, is only as up to date as the model it was trained on. To give you an example of Copilot, if you go and ask chat, Copilot chat, what's the latest version of Kubernetes? 1.22. Okay, I think we're up to like 1.28 now. So, you know, it's still behind. There's some, I thought it's characterized uh, at one point as like the 2021 problem, but it is because that was what kind of was current at 2021. Now, it, they do update this. In fact, they've updated some of the bases, um, I think as recently, maybe even as August of this year. But chat has a different base than the uh, actual Copilot in there. You have to be aware of that. It also services in situations where, for example, uh, something's been deprecated. There was a case I was trying to do, I think it was in Go, seeding a random number. And the seed function, I probably won't get this right, had been deprecated. And, you know, uh, ask Copilot, hey, is this been deprecated? Nope. But it had been, and so it actually didn't pick up on that. Now, there are ways around that. For example, you can take uh, updated documentation and paste it in your file for context in some cases, and it can go off and it can generate and key off of that. So there are ways around it that are worth being aware of. Length of response. Sometimes the uh, amount of data that it gives back may not be quite enough. I was talking about that example where I was trying to generate a mapping of states to area codes. It goes for a while and after it gets down to like, I think Ohio or something, it stops because that's as much data as it passes back. And you can go ahead and prompt it and you can give it say, more specifically complete this pattern, uh, you know, for the state starting with M through Z or whatever. There are ways to get around that, but you have to be aware there can be cases where your response will get filtered. It is always generative, not deterministic. This is a feature of, obviously, generative AI. However, it can be something you have to be aware of that anytime you're using it, 
if you think you're due to do the exact same thing twice, you may still see different results. I've seen videos out there even from the folks at GitHub, you know, doing the thing sort of like, okay, this is generative AI, uh, we'll see what happens with it, and sometimes things don't exactly turn out as people plan, because it is the case that it's still taking the effect of context, and so you can't, you can't expect necessarily the same suggestion, the same kind of thing repeatedly in there. And that's just something you have to be aware of. But again, as long as it's giving you feedback and giving you code back, you can make the best decision off of what you get offered. Some data going across. Now, is this a challenge? Well, I only say this because obviously as you're talking about cloud-based, you have some of your data in the context of going into the prompt, it's going back across the wire, okay? It's not as, as uh, significant as something like ChatGPT, where if you were just using that on company data, of course, and stuff could get out into the wild that way. Copilot has guards against this. It has things to pre help prevent things about against things getting outside of that. But it is something to consider, especially if you're in an environment where you are trying to uh, think about legal implications, or you're trying to help roll this out at your company. Uh, you know, you need to make sure that everybody is on board with that. And I will say, uh, GitHub, I just did a trial not long ago uh, for a set of people, and I will say GitHub is great about sharing information about what gets passed along and all the legal things as well. And so it was, a, you know, a very collaborative uh, environment. Okay, real quickly, Copilot pricing for individuals versus businesses. Individuals, is a $10 a month. Uh, you can sign up for that. There's for Copilot for Business, it's $19 a month per user. Now, what Copilot for Business buys you is things like uh, having license management, policy management. It gives you that sort of enterprise level control of the licenses, the policies, and so on. If you want to sign up for Copilot and try it out, you can go into your GitHub settings and you can go in and say try Copilot and you can sign up there for it. Now it is uh, free in certain instances if you're part of the um, uh, GitHub has a student program and teacher programs. There's a couple of use cases where you can get it free, but in general it's gonna be $10 a month. When you go through, you'll actually get to a dialogue that says, do you want to allow us to allow the suggestions to match public code, okay? So what Copilot is doing is taking the context of what you have going out, looking at the large language model, and if it happens to generate a sequence that actually matches public code, and you have this allow on, it will put that back. Obviously, that could be a bad thing in terms of the licensing infringement and so on. So in most cases, you'd wanna turn that off. I will say that for the business side, they do have a beta right now where they actually have a process, if it matches public code, if you allow that and matches public code, it'll pop up and tell you what license it is. It'll point you to the license and so on. So you could, if you thought that it was reasonable, you know, for some reason to have the public code matches come back, maybe you wanted to see what was out there, maybe you wanted to give credit back, do that. You could actually, if you're on that, on that uh, beta and using that process, get notifications that the code matches and the licensing are behind that. Once you've got it all uh, signed up for, you can go ahead and install it. It works with JetBrains, Visual Studio Code, uh, any of JetBrains uh, IDEs, Visual Studio Code, Visual VS Code, NeoVim. Anybody use NeoVim? A couple of people? Cool. I've never heard of it until I actually got into looking at this. Uh, also, Code Spaces, GitHub Code Spaces. If, you use, if any of you use that, you can use that, uh, Copilot and that. Copilot extensions, this is from the VS Code uh, model. Copilot extensions, the main extension is the one in the upper left, GitHub Copilot. That is just the uh, integration into the IDE. It doesn't include the chat. Just the integration to the IDE to be able to get the suggestions back, be able to accept, approve, so on. Uh, GitHub Copilot chat, that is the chat feature the sidebar that gives you the way to enter questions or ask it things and so on. GitHub Copilot Voice, haven't really played with this one, but allows you to interact with it through your voice. Uh, GitHub Copilot Lab. Copilot Lab is their experimental stuff, stuff that may or may not make it. 
It's got some interesting things in it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of those later on. Copilot shortcuts. When you actually get Copilot integrated into your IDE, into the environment, you've got a couple of different shortcuts in there. You've got some keyboard shortcuts here. And then in the upper left, showing you an example of a little toolbar that pops up. So you're in your IDE working, Copilot comes back with suggestions. And you have an option to accept the line, accept the words. It may give you more than one suggestion there. You can use the uh, keys there to go through them. Uh, click on less than, greater than, so on. You can have the option to accept the entire line, so toolbar, and so on. Uh, there's also another one that's worth noting here. A little circle down. This will be at the bottom of your IDE. A little Copilot icon or face. That allows you to toggle Copilot on and off. Uh, in things like for globally, turn it off, turn it back on, uh, or for a particular kind of application you're working with. The reason to do this might be that it might be interfering with your thought process as you're working along, or it might be interfering with your autocomplete. Sometimes autocomplete and copilot can kind of buy for your attention and stuff. So if you wanted to turn it off temporarily, turn it back on, there's like a keyboard or a shortcut for that. There's also when you have copilot chat installed, there you can hit the command I key and it can actually bring up a little window and you give you a chance to start typing in, asking questions for chat. Uh, it also has some shortcuts under what we call slash commands. Chat, this is Copilot chat again, it's still in beta, uh, separate from the basic Copilot, but chat has what we call slash commands for key functionality. Allows users to perform some common tasks without having to retype things every time. So the basic idea is for the current file or the selected code you have that's highlighted, you can go and do it, tell things like simplify, explain the code, fix it, so on in there. Now there's some of these that are uh, available in some IDEs, not the others, depending on the ID function, IDE functionality, but uh, VS Code typically has the superset of them. In some cases, some of these shortcuts, these flash commands, will also invoke functionality that wouldn't be involved via prompts alone. For example, the uh, create workspace there. Uh, create workspace, you could say something like um, create workspace, a React app that shows a Tetris board, something like that. And it will go out and work with the LLM to actually generate the directory structure and then generate the basic code as well. So it'll go through and do kind of macro level operations. Real quick, just wanted to mention that we talk about Copilot. Copilot is an overarching architecture or uh, umbrella technology that Microsoft is working with. Uh, things like for Office 365, uh, where they're going to be, you know, integrating it with uh, this is in beta now, integrating it with things like you know Teams chats, your Outlook stuff, and everything. So you can do things like ask it to go and summarize a meeting you just had in chat. But the point of this is just to say, if you talk about Copilot, there's a larger umbrella framework there versus just saying GitHub Copilot, which is the specific thing that's integrated into GitHub. All right, so how does Copilot work kind of at a high level? So at a high level, we can think of Copilot as having been trained on the public code that was out there. Now, originally it used a thing called Codex or Codex, uh, which was really just source control, or that's not source control, source code, really just code out there. But now it's done with uh, chat GPT 3.5 uh, integrated there, basically. So you have the model is trained, the large language model. The user installs Copilot, starts writing the code. And then in their IDE, whichever one they choose, we, they install the code, GitHub Copilot app. And basically, Copilot is gathering context. As you are typing, as you are working, it's doing things to gather context from things like the file name that you have and also from any other open file. Doesn't do the closed files in there yet, they're working on that, but if you have files open in the IDE, that's one way to give Copilot more context, to get better suggestions back, is to open up other files with related code or code done in the style that you want it to mimic or to follow. So it also then can pick up code from comments. You can have comments in there about what the code should do, what you want it to do, those kinds of things. 
You can have code before and after the cursor, and even things like whether the last suggestion was accepted. All of those then become part of what we call the prompt. So the prompt effectively then gets put back, constructed, passed back over to uh, GitHub. GitHub may do some processing on it. And then it can go into the large language model, be processed, get some suggestions back, some generated suggestions. Those can go back to GitHub. GitHub adds a few extra things on it. Like, for example, they have some processing that actually checks to see if it looks like it's secure or not. Now, it doesn't actually run security screening against it. Instead, what it tries to do is use the large language model to look for things that are like patterns like SQL injection or credentials or something that might be in it. So it does try to do some things to prevent it from handing it back code that might be insecure or bad. So it does the extra, a little bit of extra processing on it, passes it back, and then it's available to you uh, in your IDE. So you can also have Copilot chat in your IDE. And basically it has a screen there. You can actually ask it a question, get the prompts and so on. I'll show you that in just a few minutes. Last thing real quick, Copilot X, what things they're working on next? Uh, chat interface to provide the users with responses for things like docs, generating docs. Uh, technically chat, I think is still part of Copilot X, but Copilot CLI, uh, being able to have on the command line and say, I want to be able to have a command line for this tool that generates this kind of thing, put that out there. Copilot for pull request, being able to put in things like Copilot summary and automatically have a generated paragraph summary or a, a form about changes in the pull request, so on. Uh, Copilot for PRs, things like resolving issues with AI. The example they give you here, somebody says, hey, you want to you should replace TensorFlow with PyTorch? So Copilot could go off and help you with that or power to AI power to view responses, uh, completion, and so on. So lots of different things that they are working on with that. All right, let's get to the fun stuff and see if we can uh, do some demos here. So get out of this. And get down to my VS code. All right, try to talk and narrate at the same time, or talk and type at the same time, which can always be a challenge, but let's see what we can do here. All right, uh, let's fire up a new file. Uh, let's do one for prime numbers. All right, see right away, Copilot said, hey, if you wanna ask me to do something, go ahead and do it in here. I'm just gonna start typing and I am going to go in and say, let's create, uh, I'll just start typing. And I'm going to start defining a function here for that to say, tell me if this is the, uh, you know, to create a prime number. Now notice that what happened was it immediately figured out from the context there, gave me a suggestion about a function to do that. Now, one of the things about this, if I don't like the actual suggestion that it gave me, I can actually tell it and say, go off and generate some other suggestions for me. In this case, it's usually 10 suggestions it tries to, not always. So I'm gonna look through here and give it, look the ones it gave for, to me. And, uh, you know, I'll pick one. Oh, let's pick the longest one because the mo most code is always right, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, so I'll say that one. Okay, great. Um, now let's say that, mm, still not sure if that's about that that's the best way to do it. So I'm gonna highlight it, and I'm gonna go over to Copilot Chat, and I'm gonna tell it, simplify. And it says it's thinking, here's a simplified version of the code, blah, 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 and it explains to you why it is simplified, why it is, is quote unquote, simpler, better than the other one. Uh, if I decide that's what I want, I can simply click in here and I can actually just say, insert this as cursor. Okay, good. All right, we've got a simpler version of the code. Let's suppose that I am careless, as I often am, and uh, I am going to uh, just do, I'll change this to X, try that. 
Now you notice that immediately there's a little light bulb that pops up here. If I click on this, right click, I get Fix Using Copilot, Explain Using Copilot. Well, let's say I'm being just typing along and I'm too tired and I want to have Copilot explain it to me. Copilot says I'm right, which is a nice re you know, reaffirmation here. Um, but there seems to be a typo in the code. Variable X should be I instead, blah, blah, blah. Here's the correct code. I can also, though, just tell Copilot it fix. And it'll go off. And after a moment, made changes, waiting for diagnostics. And it'll give me a little thing here that says, hey, this is what I think. Is this okay? Yep, sure. I'll go ahead and accept it. All right. So we just hit fixed it, simplified it, right? Very contrived examples, but you can get the idea. Uh, let's see, what else can we do? Let's suppose that we want Copilot, and again, very contrived examples. Uh, we talked about generating code, but uh, let's tell it to explain the code above line by line. So it starts in there. No, once you start explaining, okay, there you go. Prime, you want to go. Function, it takes an argument. Again, you get varying results depending on this. And in this case, it's not going to be as clear in there as we want you like it to be. But you can also, we should be able to go over here to chat. And oftentimes I will go to chat and say, let's see, let's tell it to explain the code here and see what it does. And sometimes I find Doing it in the chat, yeah, you can see it gives a better explanation of it there as well. Um, and it gives a much longer explanation as well. Now, one of the things, if you don't have chat, you can do things. You can still ask questions in your IDE. Little uh, tip trick in here, for example, if I go back and I say, let's go under here. Let's say that I'm going to have a comment. And I say Q question. So you get the Q colon asking a question. Uh, let's say I'm trying to figure out what values I would expect to use in a test case. What are the prime numbers? Let's see if it's suggested. Yeah, 1 in 100. Sure, we'll take that. So I'll go ahead and ask it that. And see, it comes back with code. What I was really expecting it to do was come back with an answer. This is what I'm saying. It's never the same thing twice. Uh, but actually, if you let's see if I can get it, there it goes. Sometimes you give it a comment. That's what I mean kind of by nudging it. Sometimes you have to give it a little bit more thing of what you want it. Sometimes it will generate comments and start putting out, and you say, oh, no, no, I want code. So you might start typing function, for example. Uh, if I go to the next one, hopefully it will generate, yep, the other ones, and so on. So you can, if you don't have chat, you can still use this shortcut to get in there. What else can we do with it? Let's take a look at generating some tests. Let's tell it now, one of the things I said you can do with it is aside from just typing and getting it to generate examples, let's tell it to go in and uh, generate, uh, oh, let's say create a function. Let's say create a function to generate or to do five unit test of the code above. And we'll give it a second, see if it's going to pick up on it. There we go. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that one. Uh, again, I could do the control enter, and I could probably get other ones as well, but that's, a, that's probably okay. Now, one of the other things you can do, again, sometimes I find that chat will actually do, um, actually do a better job of these kinds of things. So let's go over here and let's do the slash uh, test command and see what that generates. So we'll let it go and says, here, sure, here's a set of tests. You can tell it's already generating quite a bit more code for you there. Uh, you know, again, that may or may not be what you want, but it also gives you an explanation. Test includes cover a wide range input values, blah, blah, blah. Is there true, is there false? So I could, if I wanted to, just go on up here and I could actually say, let's go click in here. And one of the options, insert into a new file, so I can insert it into a new file, have that, rename it, have the code in there as well. Uh, what else can we do with it? Let's say that I want to have it, I'll try to do this from memory, generate the 
Python code to call Kate's API to scale a deployment to three replicas. Now, for those of you who know Kubernetes, um, you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about, but if not, you can probably still get it from your example Python code statement in there, and so on. So I'll go in and I'll just throw this into a, a new file. And let's say I'm going to go, but you know what? I, I figured out that I really would like to do this in Go instead. So I'm going to go over here and say, um, make sure I get my command right. Let's just try it and see. Translate the selected code into Go. Here's the equivalent code in Go. So now it gives you the code back in Go there. Now, you know, obviously I'd want to take, run it through, test it out, that kind of thing as well. I can also tell it to uh, review the selected code, see what it says about that. Selected code is a Python, blah, blah, blah. In there, overall, the code is simple and efficient way to scale a deployment in Kubernetes. However, it assumes deployment is in the default namespace, doesn't handle any errors that might occur during processing, and so forth. So you kind of get the idea. Um, got a couple of minutes left. Let's do a different one. Let's suppose that I want to do, let's say, JavaScript. I'll actually, I like to do different languages when I'm demoing this sort of stuff. Um, all right, so we've got JavaScript here. Let's do the command I and say, well, let's just ask it here. Give me a regular expression to validate an email address. So you can give me a, there. There's a uh, const email rec is in there. Uh, let's. What else do we want to do? Let's. Uh, sure. We'll go ahead and accept that. Let's say. Let's tell it to generate a function to validate a URL and return the components. Component parts, sure. Let's see what it does. Now, sometimes you get stuck in this kind of loop where it actually will go in and uh, it'll go through and sometimes it'll start generating comments and stuff. Sometimes you have to prompt it. Uh, let's try jump function, see if it actually prompts. Yeah, there we go. All right, so you see I've got examples here for this. Now, if I did, I could accept the word at a time if I wanted to using uh, the command and the tab and the arrow key. I'll just go ahead and accept this one though, and so on. I can also do some things. Um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, generate a mapping, the one I was talking about, between, or uh, generate a mapping of state abbreviations and area codes. Yep, JavaScript's fine. All right, state area codes. Let's see if it actually does it. So sometimes, like I said, you have to kind of give it a little bit. All right, let's see what the what does it do here. Fix using Copilot. See if it gets anything back. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Yep, there we go. So you've got some in there. And you can see sometimes that's a little tip I've found as well. Sometimes if it doesn't generate things or if it starts kind of generating things that aren't really making it clear, you can go ahead and just tell it to fix in there and it'll actually generate in there. Now that's not all of them, but you can see it generates some data for you. So those kinds of things. Uh, there's lots of other things you can do with it. You can generate like this SQL and so on in there. Um, I thought though it might take a few minutes, so questions. We have to yell, but does anybody have questions they want to ask about it? Yes, sir.
So on the sign up page back in the slides there, it says you have to date, pass the code back or not. Uh, no, I don't think it's required in there. Now, there is code that goes back to, there is stuff that goes back to GitHub. I think what that one's talking about, to go back and look at it, is whether or not they can use it or incorporate it to improve their model. So they actually do have telemetry though. They'll go back and they'll figure out how much of their suggestion was used in their code. And there, so there's stuff that passes back and forth. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you pass a UNL diagram? Not that I know of. I don't think they're that quite there, they're there yet. So I don't know if, uh, do you do have a chat GPT or something? I don't think, I don't think Copilot, I don't think you can do that with Copilot. Oh yeah? Oh, so there was, okay. You take pieces and feed it to Copilot directly? Okay, well, all right, I learned something then, all right. Gentleman said you could ask it to generate a mermaid diagram from the code. And mermaid does lie. Okay. Cool. Other questions? All right, folks. No other questions in there. There's lots of other examples, but I don't want us to uh, go over our time here. Hope it was useful to you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>